started to thank everyone for joining us for the first webinar of an ongoing webinar series pertaining to Mobotics Thermal Radiometry and Human Body Temperature Detection. My name is Kurt Dow, and I'm the Business Development Manager for the South Central Region for Mobotics. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce my co-panelists for today's webinar. I'd like to welcome Ben Conway, who will be driving our presentation and providing insight from his experiences in regards to this topic. Uh, ben is a really good friend of mine and one of the smartest guys I know. He's our business development manager covering the Southeast. Uh, he's from uh, Ohio. He's an Ohio State guy, but uh, has spent most of his time in Atlanta. But now he's quarantined in the Florida Panhandle. So things aren't too bad uh, in Ben's world uh, today. Also joining me is Amy Sherman. Amy has been with Mobotics for just about a year and has recently taken over inside sales management duties for the South Central and the Southeast regions uh, for Mobotics. Uh, Amy, uh, we're, we're very excited to have her, Ben and I both. Uh, she is quarantined in Manhattan's Upper West Side, so not quite as fortunate as Ben. Uh, but Amy, would you like to say a few words since you're the newbie? Sure. Um, hello and uh, good afternoon, everybody from the New York City Upper West Side. Um, and I'm actually very excited to start working um, with uh, Ben and Kurt and my adventure working with them. Um, and uh, thank you all again for joining this thermal webinar. Um, so Kurt is correct. I am not as fortunate as Ben. Um, I'm actually in the epicenter of this virus. And we had just got told here in New York City that our shelter in place has been extended till May 15th. So <laughs> with that being said, I'm just here riding out the storm. Um, but fortunately, all is safe and sound on my end. Um, so I'm actually happy to be joining this webinar to have some human interaction. And again, thank you very much for joining, and we hope you actually learn a lot, and um, we can help you come up with some solutions and solve your customers' problems. And I'll be answering any questions. Well, okay, thanks, Amy. Uh, Amy's going to be monitoring the question pane for us today, so please feel free to ask questions uh, as they arise. We will do our best to get to every uh, every question. However, we do have an extremely full room, and in the interest of time, if we're not able to get to each question, we will certainly answer those in an email uh, afterwards. Lastly, most of us are all working from home, so if my killer black lab or ferocious golden retriever act up, I apologize in advance. Uh, also, please make sure uh, that, that you're muted, and I think everybody's muted, so that should not be a problem. But with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, it's really great to virtually be here for this event. Uh, it is crazy and unfortunate that this is our, our new norm. And as Amy was mentioning, I'm not sure we're, we're close to even being over the hump. Uh, this is obviously a very serious time. People are losing their lives at an alarming rate. Uh, I am advanced in my years, and I've never witnessed anything like this before, honestly. The economy is basically shut down. Unemployment is expected to cost approximately 47 million jobs. We had 6.6 uh, .6 million in claims last week alone. Uh, many of you on this call have either applied for the payroll protection program or for loans just to keep your employees and your people afloat. Uh, my wife is a small business owner. She's a chiropractor in Arlington, Texas, and she and I are seeing firsthand the impact this pandemic uh, has had on small business. But the truth is, it's not just small business. The travel industry, airlines and hotels, the energy industry, oil and gas, retail, hospitality, restaurants and bars, and many, many others are obviously being affected. So small and large businesses alike and all of those in between uh, are feeling the pain. Uh, there's so much uncertainty right now. Uh, our traditional business is down. Honestly, people just aren't real concerned about physical security. Uh, during this time, they're more concerned about when we will actually get back to work. So what do we do? What do you do? How, how do we all ensure our own employment? The fact of the matter is uh, we have to find a way. And the truth of the matter is our phones are blowing up like we haven't seen before. And our new normal has gone from a combination of indoor and outdoor optical products to thermal radiometry products. Honestly, 
Uh, I don't like to think about capitalizing on this pandemic. It just seems wrong. Uh, but people are looking for solutions. How do we open up our country? How do we all get back to work? I think South Korea is a good example. They were the first to aggressively adopt thermal optics as a measure to combat this pandemic. Uh, what seemed like a pipe dream at one, at one point to those of us in this industry is becoming much more mainstream. People didn't think you could sell thermal imaging outside of large industry like oil and gas, for instance, or heavy industrial. But now manufacturing plants, schools, hospitals, large retail, office buildings, executive suites, they're all looking for a solution. Uh, and we're going to break that down for you today, what we are seeing in the markets ourselves. Uh, and this is a real paradigm shift. And it's all we can do today to react to all the thermal inquiries and demand that we are seeing. Now, let me be real. I don't think the nail salon down the street is going to jump on thermal. However, large retail and the others that I've already mentioned, they already are. Uh, even the presidential task force has mentioned thermal technology as a tool to get America moving again. And I believe the real shift is still months away. Uh, what we're seeing today is just the early adopters. But in a month or two, the shift I'm referring to is when the country shifts from reactive to be more proactive. So here's a question. Does it seem feasible to assume that a company may invest eight to $10,000 for a solution to help keep their doors open? to keep their employees working, and to ensure the revenue keeps flowing? The simple answer is yes, and we're already seeing this in large numbers. As Mobotics integrators and users, you know that the way to win with Mobotics is solving customer needs, solving their problems, and doing it better than any of the alternatives that are out there on the market. We're going to talk about that today and how to accomplish that. Also, and we don't get to say this often in the world of Mobotics, we're not only the best solution for thermal, but we're also one of the least expensive. For example, I'm aware of a Chinese solution that's approximately $14,000, which includes a thermal camera, a black body radiator, a server with facial recognition software, as well as management software. As you are all aware, we do not need all of those components to accomplish this task with Mobotics. We are the only thermal solution that is an IoT Edge device with logic built into the camera, a solid state device that'll last 10 plus years, and we can measure temperature in up to 20 distinct areas in a frame. We are definitely the leaders in this regard. So this is the opportunity before us. This is where we need to focus our energy. That's not to say uh, that we will not or cannot sell optical solutions right now because we are. We do have customers moving projects forward, but my message to you is to get as comfortable as you can talking about and selling thermal radiometry. With Mobotics, you are equipped with the best solution on the market today and at a great turnkey price uh, compared to the others out there in the market. And the differentiator is the intelligence of the edge device. My personal sales funnel has totally flipped from 80% optical, 20% thermal to 80% thermal, 20% optical. So there, there is a way. So uh, I'm going to cover some things today that many of you have ar already know about Mobotics. However, we do have some new Mobotics partners and some end users on the call. So please oblige me a bit as I cover some things that many of you already know. Because the Mobotics DNA, the building blocks of Mobotics, are what makes our thermal special. As many already know, Mobotics is a German company with all R&D, hardware, software, design, development, production, and quality assurance done in Langmau, Germany. Uh, the U.S. headquarters is in New York City, which, as Amy was saying, is, is an epicenter of, of things going on right now surrounding uh, this pandemic. We do have seven sites worldwide. As you can see all the locations listed here, these are all areas hit hard and affected by the pandemic. We are at the center of it, so it's important to us to provide solutions to get us back to work and get these global economies moving. It's also important to note that Konica Minolta owns a majority of Mobotics. They are obviously a powerful global company, uh, but they're also a true partner of Mobotics. Uh, they're a true partner in software development, 
hardware and go to market strategy and you will see many new and innovative things in the future from this partnership. You have heard and will hear us continue to talk about the Mobotics DNA. Mobotics made the first true smart device back in 1999. Think about that. In 1999, Mobotics had the foresight to come out with a product that was a true edge device long before the term IoT ever existed. Our decentralized concept was revolutionary at that time and has proven to be the right move as we are the only IoT edge device, a computer that sits at the edge that you can put any combination of sensors on. Thermal, which is our focus today, optical, illumination, decibel levels, and the list goes on. With dual sensors, two-way audio, onboard analytics, integrated storage, lip synchronous audio, moonlight technology, and I could go on and on and feature you to death. The point is that Mobotics is a computer that sits at the edge. We do not need additional hardware and software to make a human body temperature solution work. As a fun note, many of you may know or you may not that Mobotics was the pioneer of hemispheric technology. Big deal, right? Everybody has it today. Yes, that's correct but Mobotics was the pioneer and has pioneered over 40 patents uh, and we are not slowing down. It's also important to note our commitment to be the leader in cybersecurity. Since all R&D and uh, hardware and software development, design and production happened in Germany, we actually control the process from start to finish. A main component in our cactus concept is the fact that we are decentralized, meaning processing, analysis and storage are all carried out on the camera. They are encrypted and controlled by the camera itself. Uh, this offers system dependent protection against data loss to third parties looking to do bad things. We have developed a unique concept for the reliable and complete protection of end-to-end -end video systems against hacker attacks. And we are constantly uh, having penetration testing conducted to ensure we are the best in class so you can rest assured you're deploying the most secure system. And I really like this slide because it is really hammering home a couple of points. Not only are we staying current by providing updated security patches, we are doing this for all of our cameras back to 2004, which brings me to the second point on Mobotics durability. We all know this is a solid state device with no moving parts and a mean time between failure of over nine years. But this shows we still have cameras deployed that are over 16 years old. That's pretty cool in my opinion. Uh, again, I said I wasn't gonna uh, feature you to death, but a few other key things to know. Uh, we have uh, SIP built into the cameras, microphone speaker, uh, modular design so you can add a camera to a system at any time without adding additional components. Uh, I've already mentioned the solid state. Uh, low power consumption, we are a very green uh, product. And uh, I've already mentioned the onboard analytics and decentralized. Um, so you all are probably knowledgeable about our accessory boxes and I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but I do wanna point out the GPS box because when we are talking about uh, a human body temperature solution, we are recommending you to use the GPS box. It's not just providing GPS location data, it's also a good time server for an overall solution where all cameras can sync to. But the reason it's important here is that it has an external thermometer giving you a true ambient temperature, uh, which will be critical in programming the overall solution. I'd also like to point out that not all thermal sensors are created equal. We use 50 millikelvin sensors as opposed to the 100 millikelvin you see on the right. I believe this slide depicts the difference in detail that you can pick up with the 50 millikelvin over the 100. Uh, and solutions come in, in two flavors uh, with Mobotics. And most of the solutions out there today are opting for the M16, which you see on the left, uh, with a thermal radiometry sensor uh, as well as an optical sensor so you can see thermal and optical. Uh, we also have this available in our S16, uh, which you see on the right-hand side, which uh, the, the lenses themselves are independent of each other, so it provides a little more flexibility depending on the solution that you want to deploy. 
So now to the meat of why we are here, uh, human body temperature detection. When set up correctly, we can provide very effective and efficient screenings, a first line of defense. It is obviously non-contact, uh, but proven to be very effective. I'm gonna actually steal a little bit of Ben's thunder uh, with an analogy he used with me of TSA screening at the airport. I have a titanium hip because at one point in my career, uh, I was an endurance athlete, proud finisher of the New York City Marathon in 2017, but that's neither here nor there. But if I go through a metal detector, it lights up and sounds all sorts of alarms. It does not mean that I have a gun or a weapon and I wish to do anybody harm. It just says, you might want to pat this guy down and see what's going on. That's how you need to view the thermal solution. It's a first line of defense. It's not magic, uh, just like a metal detector is not magic. It requires calibration to set emissivity levels, ambient temp levels, add logic, which Ben, you, you we're gonna talk about shortly, but it's the true first line of defense. Uh, so with that, thank you for obliging me with uh, some of the recap. Now I'm gonna pass it over to Ben Conway and he's gonna get into a little more detail. Right, Kurt, thank you so much for the intro. And I'd just like to reiterate and thank everybody uh, on the webinar today. Thank you so much for your time. I uh, really appreciate your interest. And I've got to reiterate what Kurt mentioned. What we're seeing today here at Mobotics is really exciting because we've got a solution, I think, that can do a ton of good. It can genuinely help customers and the end user. But we've got a technology that does this in a way that I think is different and just about everyone else out in the market. And when you start to peel back the layers, you can really see that Mobotic stands out as, uh, I think, really the only solution. When we start talking about using thermal technology to allow people to start entering premises safely and get a, an idea if they have an elevated body temperature or not, uh, there's a lot we can do here. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes, I wanna show you a few video clips, discuss maybe a little bit of kind of the, the nuts and bolts and the mechanics, how we do it, what we recommend for really optimizing your results. And then hopefully we're gonna have some Q&A from uh, some time here at the end to make sure we're really addressing what you may be seeing in the market or maybe some of the concerns you have. But I'm gonna start off my portion and just show you this video clip. For those of you that have been in the Mobotics community for a while, you've probably seen this. I think it's a great example to highlight the solution we're talking about today, actually getting a read on surface level skin temperature as someone's walking through an area. And this video, I think, shows us a lot. You see the two guys walking through the hallway here, and um, the, let me replay that. The guy on the left, you don't even see his temperature uh, reading whatsoever. The, the guy on the right, you do, just mildly. You see the outline of his face as he walks by, and as, you walk, as they walk back the other way, you just see a slight heat signature from the guy on the right. It's hard to tell here. They're, they've got little thermometers on their chest that are set in Celsius. But one guy, the guy on the left is in 37 degrees Celsius, the guy on the right's at 39. So why is that important? You're only seeing the heat signature from the guy that has a mildly elevated surface temperature. And this just goes, I think, speaks to the customizability, the flexibility that you've got within the Mobotics camera. You can really dial in these thermal sensors to uh, look for narrowly defined ranges. They're extremely sensitive, as, as Kurt had mentioned, but they also have the ability to kind of let you tailor this to who's watching this. So if you put yourselves in the shoes of, say, a nurse, she's been tasked with watching the live image of people entering the building, you know, as they, they come into work at eight o'clock, and she's there, it's a long shift. If you're watching uh, this live footage of just countless people walking by and you're watching the entire thermal spectrum you know, that can get pretty tiring on your eyes pretty quickly. What am I looking for? What's a hot spot? What am I concerned with? In this case, this makes it very easy to visually see if there's someone walking down a corridor that's above your set threshold, whatever that may be, 100 degrees, 101 degrees, whatever your, your concern area is. Well, that's what's going to show up in the thermal. It's only going to be showing the, the pixels, the hot pixels that are above your predefined threshold. Again, this is just one option. You may not want to have it set up this way. You may want to see the entire heat signature of every person walking by. 
There's a ton of different alerts we can set up, which I'll get into here shortly, that when someone walks by above a, a predefined threshold, we can trigger alerts from phone calls and emails and all sorts of things. But just at a very base level, from a visualization standpoint, you can customize these thermals to do all sorts of things visually. And this is one of my favorite examples showing that it looks like a blue screen, people walking back and forth all day long. I'm only gonna get an image uh, showing up on my screen if someone's above my, my uh, concern threshold. I gotta sort of piggyback a little bit on what Kurt had just mentioned is, yeah, there are some considerations with this. This is not a medical device. Uh, we're not an FDA approved medical device. We're not claiming to be able to tell you that we can detect someone has a fever, or someone has coronavirus. You know, that, that is not what we're saying here at all. This is really a measuring tool that when it's installed properly in the right conditions, uh, we can be very, very accurate with detecting elevated body surface temperatures. And it's really a first line of defense. We love that metal detector example because I think that really sort of drives the concept home. As people are walking through the airport going through a metal detector and that metal detector goes off, you can't automatically assume that person has a bomb, but you may want to pat them down, pull them off to the side and go to your second layer protocol. I think it's, it's pretty similar in this case. If someone's coming into your building and the thermal camera is picking up you know, an alert that they're maybe hotter than they should be, we can't say they have a fever. We don't know they have coronavirus, but for some reason they do have an elevated surface temperature that you may want to pull them off to the side and go to your second level protocol screenings, whatever that happens to be. And there, there could be a number of reasons why you have an elevated body surface temperature. You know, we've got to be real about that. That doesn't mean it's because you have a fever. It could have been because you were standing out in the parking lot on a hot day talking on the phone for 20 minutes and the, 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 your forehead is overheated. So when you walk into the building, you walk by the camera, well, sure, you're going to be hotter than you probably normally would be had you sat in the building for a few minutes and, and cooled down. Yeah, I have some, some partners tell me, oh, man, we got a false positive because someone walked by the camera and they forgot to take their earbuds out and the camera picked up the, the elevated heat signature from their earbuds. So we have to be real about this. There are some just true day-to-day -day, uh, considerations, some limitations you have to be aware of. But when all that's sort of uh, taken under consideration and you look at the solution for what it can do, we can really dial this in and have a pretty powerful screening tool. A few things I'd say to optimize the results. We get this question every day, and I imagine those of you on the webinar, you're probably wondering this as well. Okay, where do I install it? How do I install it? Uh, what's the, the ideal scenario? We'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in the nuts and bolts, but a few, a few things to just hit right off out of the gate is this is really gonna be ideal in a controlled environment. So when we say that, we're typically meaning indoors, ideally. We want to see the room temperature, the humidity uh, be pretty stable because all those environmental factors, distance and acidity, the temperature, the humidity in the room, that can affect uh, the, the thermal uh, in terms of the heat signature that it's picking up. So the, the more stable, the better, the closer to the target, the better. Most of our results, most of what you're gonna see me show you here in a few minutes is showing you know, sample results and images from usually within 15 feet. You know, six to 10 feet is pretty common. You can get 10 to 12, 15 feet. We've even done tests up to 20 feet. But for my personal comfort level, I like to see this being set up within 15 feet of the person that we're, we're trying to scan. We need to have a clear view of the face as well. So if someone's just passing by quickly and their, their head's down and they're looking at their phone, you know, the top of their head doesn't really do us much good. We need to get a clear shot of their face. And ideally, if we can, uh, you see there that the corner of the eye is sort of the, the closest that we're going to get to your internal core temperature on the surface of your body. So that's, that's really ideal for us. If we can get a full clear shot of your face, capture the corner of your eye, we can really say pretty confidently that the, the surface level temperature the camera's reading is going to be very close to what you have uh, in actuality. So that does present some challenges. You're going to have some people walking by that are wearing glasses. Thermal cannot see through glass. So you're, 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 that's gonna be something you have to discuss internally when you set this up. What's my protocol? When people walk up to the camera, though I have a little sticker on the floor that says, please stand here, take off your glasses. You may or may not wanna go that far. We can still have really nice accuracy results getting just a clear shot of your face and your forehead, but it really helps increase the accuracy if we can get a clear, good shot of the eye as well. So these are some things to consider. You also have to calibrate this and set the thermal range of the camera. And I honestly think that is one of the 
the biggest beneficiaries uh, or benefits that Mobotics offers is we have so much capability within the camera. Again, this is a Linux computer with a thermal lens on it. So when you dial into the camera, there's a lot we can do on board to compensate for atmospheric conditions, humidity, what the temperature is in the room, how far away that person is we're trying to scan their face. Are they six feet away, 10 feet away? We can offset for that within the camera. That's just something that virtually no one else out on the market can do. This is extremely customizable based on the environment and what you're, um, you're installing it in. We do want to jump into this quickly and address this right out of the gate. Uh, what is a black body radiator? We get this question all the time. If you look through a lot of the Mobotics literature, you'll even see our team, we reference black bodies. A lot of the competing solutions on the market, I'm sure many of you have seen, there's a lot of, a lot of folks out there that are sort of jumping on the bandwagon with thermal, and when you peel back the layers, just about all of them will tell you, you need a black body radiator to have any sort of reliable accuracy. Uh, I would go as far as to say with Mobotic, you would probably be well suited to have a black body radiator if this was in an unstable room environment. So maybe something more outdoors, under an awning, but in the typical applications that I'm seeing, hospitals, schools, medical clinics, government agencies, and we'll get into some of those success stories in a bit, but in those typical environments, we're talking about having the camera mounted indoors, typically away from you know, your lobby doors that may let in you know, gusts of hot air, typically situated away from a big HVAC vent that may be blowing in your AC, but a hallway, a choke point, somewhere behind an admission desk, somewhere where it's a relatively controlled environment, Mobotics can be extremely accurate without a black body radiator, and I think that's huge. That's one of the biggest differentiators when you look at Mobotics. If you take anything away from today, I'd like to leave you with that, is installed properly in the right environments, we don't need a black body. Our thermal is sensitive enough. Our camera has enough calibration uh, settings and customizable settings within the camera where you can hone this in without using a black body. So I'll back up a minute. What is a black body? It's basically, think of it as like a little heater, space heater. It's essentially a device that's generating a constant heat source. And most thermal cameras, they need to have that black body uh, image radiator somewhere in the thermal frame of reference. So it locks onto that and gives the camera a frame of reference. So now I know I'm calculating any changes I see in temperature, I'm calculating off this constant frame of reference, this black body radiator. Maybe it's generating 100 degrees all the time. So the thermal camera knows, hey, this is 100 degrees. If I see someone's forehead walk by, I'm calibrating my differences off the black body. So again, it's great. It can improve accuracy. We ourselves have tested quite a few of them. And we tell you, sure, the, the black bodies are a nice tool to have, but again, in an unstable environment where the, the temperature is not controlled, sure, black body is a good idea. In an indoor environment, uh, we're having great accuracy and one of the few that can say we can be within about half a degree, roughly speaking, of accuracy without a black body degree. And there's really no one out in the market that can say that uh, to my knowledge. Distance, again, we covered this. I'll just show it briefly. Uh, we've got several different thermal angle image uh, lenses. For our purposes today, we're really going to be discussing a 45 degree and a 25 degree uh, thermal uh, lens. And you'll see here, you start getting a little more divergence in accuracy the further you are away from the target. So for our purposes, we really like to be within 15 feet, as I mentioned earlier. That's really the ideal scenario for this. So a couple things, Exa example scenario. You're going to mount the camera. You're going to set this up. We're doing proof of concepts all around the world, and this is Pretty, pretty regularly how they go. We get the camera on site, we may connect it to the network, we may set a standalone network. And that's a big differentiator as well because depending on who we're talking to, you're gonna have some, some pushback potentially from their IT team. We've seen it quite a bit. You know, we've never heard of Mobotics. How do we know? I know you say you're cyber secure and you're, you're hardened. How do we know that you're not phoning home? We have back doors to some other countries. We're not gonna allow you on our network. You know, some of these agencies we talk to, that's pretty much verbatim what they tell us. So our stance on that is no problem. We're going to set this aside, set this up as a standalone rapid deployment option. So we'll mount the camera, maybe on a wall, maybe on a mobile cart. Uh, we'll, we'll connect, we'll bring our own PoE switch in. We'll load, we'll bring our own laptop. We'll load our free VMS, our included VMS software on this. Totally standalone solution, mobile rapid deployment. All the analytics, all the triggering, all the intelligence is done on board in the camera. We don't need 
to tie into your central VMS. Now down the road, once the crisis is over, and you guys say, hey, we, we really like this solution, this is gonna become standard operating procedures for business moving forward, well sure, maybe then you do a little more homework. Vet Mobotics really put us to the test and make sure that our security claims add up with what your, your uh, IT team expects. And then at that point, sure, tie Mobotics into your VMS, tie us into your Genetech system, your milestone system. But the idea here is we can really provide provide you both options depending on who your customer is. Bring it in, tie it into your VMS today, or be a totally separate standalone operation with very little hardware because, again, the intelligence and the alerting and the analytics are all on board in the camera. So that's a long way of saying we'll set it up based on what the site requirements are. We will need to measure the temperature in the room, and uh, we do a lot of our testing against you know, a medical-grade non-contact thermometer. So we'll measure someone's forehead, say, 10 feet away, and we'll draw a box in the thermal image and we'll compensate for the humidity in the room and we'll make sure that the thermal camera is picking up you know roughly the same temperature at that distance that the the non or the medical grade uh, thermometer is capturing and you may draw multiple zones of interest kurt touched on this a little bit but we are very unique in that we can draw up to 20 separate zones in that thermal image and have each one alerting separately at different levels different temperature thresholds and I'll show you visually here in a minute what that looks like. This video is just a quick, uh, sort of a recap of what I mentioned earlier, just showing how the thermal can, can be designed to alert and show a, a, an image based on a heat source or a heat signature you're worried about. In this case, you see a bucket of water passing by. It's over 50 degrees Celsius. That's all you see really is the outline of the water. You don't see the guy's body or anything else because again, he's way below that threshold of 50 degrees Celsius. So that's an example sort of like I already showed you. Um, I've got a few more video clips that I want to show that show different, different scenarios of how the thermal can be programmed. This I like to just touch on briefly because I think it's an important differentiator. When we're setting this thermal up, it's an extremely sensitive thermal lens. It can detect temperature, read the, the spectrum, the heat spectrum, if you will, from negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit all the way to 1,022 degrees Fahrenheit, everything in between. So you're talking about minor temperature differences within that range. When we're talking, and that, that traditionally would be great for a lot of the applications where we've used thermal in the past, manufacturing, or we're watching something on a, a machine floor with ball bearings and processes coming out of dryers and heaters. You know, the, a lot of variation in what those temperature thresholds will be. For this application, where we're trying to keep an eye on surface temperature of a human, that's a much more narrowly defined range, you know, maybe on the low end 95 degrees up to 105, somewhere in there, roughly 10, 12 degrees Fahrenheit. So we can program the thermal and say, look for range heat signatures only in this range. So really what you're doing there is you're allowing the, the full power of the thermal sensor to really just focus and scan heat signatures within a narrowly defined range. So the idea here is really helping increase accuracy. I'm not worried about temperatures that are negative 30 or 500 degrees. I'm really worried about you know 95 to 105 in that range and minor differences, minor changes in pixels basically is what the thermal is uh, looking for. I like to show this example. This is from one of our really good partners in Europe. They have this solution set up that shows the thermal camera with the optical overlay. So in this case, it looks like you're just looking at one optical image, but there's actually a thermal image on this choke point, but you don't even see that. It's set up in an overlay mode. So it's only gonna overlay the thermal image when somebody walks through at a set temperature or above. So if we just watch this for a few seconds, you see several guys walk through the hallway, and then when the third guy walks through, you see there, the, the camera alerts, picks it up, and it's hard to tell the outline, but you see he's got an elevated surface temperature right down here in his you know, neck, throat region, and so that's what the thermal camera is overlaying. So the idea here is let's customize the image. In a lot of applications, people love the side-by-side -side optical thermal view. In other cases, they don't want to look at a thermal image all day long. They just want to see an optical video feed, but then overlay that thermal image when someone walks through above or below a certain threshold. So I think that's a great example of showing that uh, in the real world. Another area that, that we, we're, we get questions on is, okay, what about privacy? You know, I, I don't know 
if I'm really comfortable with having my employees coming through and I'm storing video of them, you know, alerting or not alerting for certain temperatures, I don't really necessarily want to see the optical image of them. I don't want to store that. So no problem. You can certainly do a robotics camera without an optical lens and you just could have a thermal lens here. And so this is a good example from our friends here at Electronic Medical Solutions. And you see here that these two folks walking down um, a queue and the lady here on the right, she's a little bit above on her forehead. She's above the, the threshold. You see the crosshairs there. That is determining the hottest pixel in the image. See, it's right there. It looks like the corner of her eye. And then you see the red frame. So that's a sample alert. People are walking through an area, picks up a, an elevated surface temperature. Now, what do you want the camera to do about that? All the if this, then that logic that Mobotics is famous for now will kick into action. Traditionally, that could be, you know, video motion. If I see movement after hours, or if I uh, you know, have a loud noise, decibel reader in the camera, those are all typical actions that the camera can alert for. In this case, our, really the, the main trigger we're concerned about is a temperature, uh, a temperature threshold. So when the temperature threshold is tripped, what do you want the camera to do? We can pop up a red frame on your VMS. We can play a message through the speakers. That can be a canned message. It can be a customized recorded message. We can even make a phone call. These cameras have uh, SIP clients built into them. So you can have a pre-recorded message. Hey, this is camera seven at the front desk. We have a heat event. So anytime someone walks through and trips that, then the camera can actually dial somebody on your PBX, make a phone call. When they answer, they're gonna hear that predefined message. It can also, of course, begin recording that heat event. Every time someone walks through at above a certain threshold, they may want to record that event five seconds before it happened and 10 or 30 seconds after it happened. So we want to go back and watch that footage later. The idea is I don't want to get bogged down too much in all the different if this and that scenarios, but just get your imagination running and you can see all that logic that's under the hood of robotics can be applied to this application. And so once we have that heat event, let the camera start deciding what you want to do with it. We're not relying on a VMS to do the triggers, to do make sense of that data. The camera can do that for you. The analytic is there. Just tell it what you want it to do, who you want it to alert, and where we're sending these notifications to. I love this. These are a couple still shots here. This shows the radiometry actually in action. And if you look at the image on the left, you see essentially three zones. You have a zone on the, the left, zone in the middle, and then a zone on the right. And this would be a good scenario you know, where you may want to scan, you know, say, three people at the same time. And depending on how far the camera's mounted back, what angle image, I don't want to get too bogged down in details. You may have people standing six feet apart. You know, you've got tape on the floor with X's. Hey, stand here, stand here, stand here, and then look up at the camera. The idea is, though, based on where you're installing this, these zones are totally customizable. You can draw a box anywhere in the image, again, up to 20 of them. In this example, you see three, and then you can define what's my threshold in each zone. So here you see the gentleman walking through in the, uh, the crosshair right there on his cheek. You can see there that's the hottest pixel in the image, and I know it's really hard to tell up there in the, the green writing in the very top, but you can see here that's picking him up at about 98.5. So, I mean, basically dead on to 98.6, which is what his actual temperature was as he walks through the image. So no problem there, he's below our threshold, he's not gonna alert. But if you were going to have someone walking down the hallway, sort of in that middle, that middle zone, if you're picking up their face further down the hallway, you're going to have more particles between the camera and the target. So essentially more humidity, maybe some minor temperature adjustments. So you may want to then tweak that box to have a slightly different offset for your temperature because you're picking up a target further away. So again, not to admire the details, but the idea here is customize this based on where you're installing it who you're trying to pick up, and how many zones of interest you need to have. But Mobotics can do This is the, the next important question because we get this pretty regularly. Okay, this looks great. We're, we, we like the thermal. We like the, the analytics, the alerting. How accurate can this really be? And this is, again, based on our own internal findings. This is done by obviously people that know Mobotics well. We know how to program our own cameras. We're in a stable environment. These were some sample tests that were done in our New York office, so controlled room environment. But you can see here, if you can read some of the writing, the results, when we compare what the thermal camera was picking up compared to a medical grade thermometer measuring the temperature of that person, we were roughly between 0.4 to 0.7 degrees Fahrenheit 
accurate, you know, plus or minus. So I would say an average, about a half a degree, plus or minus. So when we're talking about this sort of application, body temperature screening, that's phenomenal accuracy. And again, this was done without a black body. The camera properly configured in a controlled environment, we were able to see consistently about a half a degree um, margin of error of accuracy. So this obviously, you know, I, I've been with Mobotics for quite a while. I love the technology, I believe in it, but actually seeing this being vet by my own team, seeing our own internal results, and then seeing results from the field, from partners and customers that I've been working with, validating these results, it was really rewarding for me to say, hey, actually in a real world environment, this isn't just marketing literature, this is what we can achieve. It was pretty exciting for me to see this table here. So this goes a long way of just saying exactly what I just said, sort of summing that up. An indoor application, controlled room temperature, properly configured, we can pretty consistently achieve sub one degree Fahrenheit accuracy, you know, 15 feet or under from the target, ideally. And uh, the one degree is actually being a little conservative. We're seeing a lot closer to about a half a degree, but we've got a little margin of error there. So I think next we probably want to dive into some success stories. Okay, great. Mobotics, you're setting it up. You're, you've seen it in your lab. You know, who's using this? I get that question daily as we bounce from call to call to, to demo to demo, people wanna know, okay, where are we seeing this? Are there actual businesses, are there companies using this to get back to work? Uh, has it been successful? And I think this goes to, some of these case studies here and stories were um, a little bit hand-tied or hog-tied because you can imagine some of these customers, are, they're not comfortable sharing names, they don't wanna use images. So you'll have to take my word for it. There are a lot of folks that would be on this list that if I put their names up here, they are name brands. You would know exactly who we're talking about, but uh, respecting their privacy, we're not gonna talk about a lot of individuals. The, the um, screenshot you see here on the bottom right, this was actually uh, an airport in Puerto Rico where they were gracious enough to do a little write-up showing our technology in action, what they did there at the airport, screening passengers as they came through. I think they're using 11 mobotics cameras and having phenomenal results. So this is actually a real world use case where they did a pilot, they tried one of our cameras, said absolutely, this validates exactly what we're looking for. And they, they went ahead and put a bunch more in and this is currently in operation at an airport in Puerto Rico. And another screenshot here, just quickly, the, the guy you see, um, it's hard to really tell, I know, but in the corner of the image, sort of to the top left of his hard hat, you'll see a mobotics M16 there in the corner, screening him before he comes into work. This is actually a real world use case. So the idea here is airports, hospitals, medical clinics, schools, manufacturing plants. I've personally been involved in some, some large projects in my region in the Southeast with uh, some names that I had only ever read about before. And now we're talking to them, helping them evaluate the solution, test it, vet it, make sure it works. And you know, it's obviously leading to successful implementation. So I just wanted to highlight that, but I'd like to get bring Kurt back in to, to weigh on this a little bit more. What are you seeing in your region? Because I know you're working in some different verticals than even I have here in, in Southeast in Florida and Georgia. Yeah, so a, a lot of what you mentioned, Ben, just, uh, you know, manufacturing plants that uh, have unfortunately had to shut down. I, I mean, one in particular that had, I think, 15 people test positive. So, uh, you know, how do they get back to work? How do they get back to work quickly? How do they get back to work safely? And it's utilizing uh, a robotic solution in the regard that we're talking about as a first line of defense. So uh, we're seeing, you know, in a school environment, uh, if they have a student or a teacher that comes in and is above level, then their protocol would be, hey, they need to immediately go see the nurse, right? We have other companies uh, in uh, manufacturing, heavy industrial, that they have actually hired nurses uh, that are there on call. So if somebody screens too high, uh, they, you know, the protocol is they got to go to the nurse. And again, some of them using uh, uh, actual thermometer might, uh, test out okay, right? And you, you go to work, but uh, the ones that that don't, they're they're turned away. So uh, really, we're seeing this all over the board. Large retail uh, people 
trying to gear up for, uh, you know, the economy and businesses open, opening back up. So that's a lot from my perspective. Uh, hey, one of the things I wanted to mention here, I, I understand that there have been some people having some audio issues. Some people aren't having audio issues. Um, but this is being recorded, so uh, that would be made available to, to everybody uh, at that point in time. But, Ben, if you're wrapped up, that was great, uh, right at uh, 45 minutes. So uh, if there's any questions, uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask those. Uh, as Thanks, we're Kurt. monitoring the, the pain. But we are, just so everybody knows, we are uh continuing this webinar series on thermal uh on an ongoing basis and building on these solutions since this is an ever evolving uh thing for us uh so please check uh social media check your inboxes uh we're we're trying to make sure that everybody gets this information the next session is thursday at noon uh where mark heinzman who is our business development manager out of the North Central, uh, many of you guys know Mark. He's going to do a much deeper technical dive and live demo, uh, showing you know how this is being set up and deployed and what success uh, that we're seeing. So uh, it doesn't look like we have a ton of questions. Uh, a lot of this, was, a lot of this was we can't hear. There's no audio, and then other people are saying loud and clear so uh, I there's don't know why oh go ahead there's a question from Lee um, asking about face recognition okay what do we and it just says face recognition with a question mark yeah I don't know so I don't know if, Lee, if you want to expand on your question So uh, we'll wait to see if he expands on his question. Um, yeah, we do not need, I, I can say this, we do not need facial recognition software for the application that we're talking about. Some, uh, some of the competitors out there require it, but because of what we've just been talking about, the Mobotics DNA, the fact that we're a, a you know, solid state, uh, computer that sits at the edge. We we don't need that additional software in order to uh, uh, achieve what we are what we are doing. Curtis, I'm looking through the questions. I see several coming in. Again, everybody, really appreciate this. Appreciate your interaction. Keep them coming. We've still got a few more minutes here before we wrap up. But a, a good question from Cat: Have we seen a request for these in nursing homes? And that's a great question, actually. Yes, uh, in my region, again, I'm, I'm based out of Atlanta. I'm currently in Florida at the moment, but I cover the Southeast. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and that's a big concern. You know, some of these, these elderly folks, are they exposed to this coming in or out, visitors? What, what can we do here? I think we have a great solution. And we're actually, I'm actually involved in several projects where we're vetting this and, and in the process of installing it. The, the really the only challenge that I see, just my personal thoughts on it, are some of these nursing homes we're seeing, you have a very limited window from where you enter the building to you're already in close proximity with the people there inside. So ideally, again, back to what I mentioned earlier, we, we, we're seeing the best results if we can have this in some sort of choke point, sort of sheltered away from you know big glass windows where the sun's beating in. So we'd like to have a little bit of interior insulation, if you will, so when someone's entering the building, we can get a good reading before then they enter into you know, the interior. So that's been one of the challenges. Some of these small assisted living facilities we're seeing, it's basically you walk in the front door and then you're, you're right in the middle of the, the main um, uh, common area. But outside of that, yes, we're, we're seeing a lot of success there. So I appreciate that question. And I think Anthony asked another one that, that's I think really important as well. Can you speak to some of the second layer protocols that are, people are doing once the thermal camera gets an alert, okay, somebody's hotter than they should be, what's the next step? Yeah, we can't really tell you how to do it, but I can just tell you what I've seen from the field. And a common situation would be if you have 
a nurse or somebody on staff that's qualified. You don't want her there outside all day long, scanning people one by one, exposing yourself, putting yourself at risk. She's typically inside somewhere, maybe inside a room, watching the robotics video feed, and then there's an alert. She may open the speaker on the camera and talk to that person, you know, could you please wait there for a minute? She gears up, uh, puts on a mask, comes out, uh, that person's off to the side, and then, you know, goes to the second layer, which would typically, you know, some sort of thermometer screening just to verify results. If, and if that collaborates with the camera picked up, they're usually going to send that person home. That's, that's what I'm seeing as just a sample scenario of what some of these companies are doing. Again, that assumes that you have a nurse or somebody qualified on staff to pull that person aside and check the temperature, you know, the old-fashioned way. Yeah, Ben, and as I mentioned, there are companies that are hiring, like retired nurses or, uh, you know, uh, first responder type folks who are willing to make a few extra dollars and bringing them in um, if they don't have that person on staff. Great point. Uh, the, the, here was one, will it work with Calibrator if needed because of environment? And by Calibrator, I'm assuming you're talking about a black body radiator. Uh, it absolutely will work with a black body radiator if we're in an extreme environment. And you can utilize a black body radiator uh, in a controlled environment if that's the direction that you want to go, but it's not necessary. And those black bodies are, are fairly expensive. So, uh, you know, if we can do it without utilizing that, uh, that is the preferred way to go for everybody involved. Here's a, here's a good question, Kurt. I think I want to highlight this one because I hear this every day uh, asking about some of these Chinese alternatives. You know, I'm not going to at all badmouth the technology. I can't speak to how good their thermals are or not. But I think there's one big piece there that you, you really just have to throw out there as soon as you say the word. It's a Chinese product. So some of the folks we're talking to, government, state, local, in some cases federal, hospitals, they're typically not going to want or allow a Chinese product to be on the network. So that's issue A. Okay, can I bring in a, a, a thermal device from a Chinese, per, a Chinese company to do my screening? But beyond that as well, great, Mobotics isn't Chinese. We're a Western-friendly country, manufactured in Germany. You know, all the things we talked about, cybersecurity, great. But you still may not know us from Adam. You still may not trust Mobotics any more than you do a Chinese product. But again, that's the differentiator, no problem. You don't have to then go out and invest in a VMS and all these other pieces, black body radiators, to set this up. Just go ahead and put us in a lobby, your standard standalone application, a switch, maybe a cart, TV monitor, view our software, run the camera there. We don't have to tie into your network. So I just have to hit that point at home again because that's been really key for us in some of the conversations we're having high level with some of these organizations. Uh, yeah, how are you different than the Chinese products? And great, but how would I allow you to do this as sort of a temporary screening solution without giving you access to my network before we fully vet you. So I think we're really kind of hitting two major concerns there on that one point. What else are you seeing, Ben? All right, so I've got some good questions here. Um, uh, besides real-time monitoring, is there any integration to access control to restrict badge access if a temperature level uh, is elevated? And the short answer is absolutely that's achievable. Out of the box, you know, there's going to be some certain access control uh, devices that, that we Mobotics does integrate with natively. We also have a very feature-rich API. So we need to, without just saying a blanket yes to that, we need to dig down a little bit more into who you're using or what you want to propose, how the network's configured. But short answer is yes, that can absolutely be done. This is a really good question. I'll be honest, I don't know the answer to this. Does the, the person monitoring does it have to be a healthcare provider or could any lay person with medical training? It's a great question. I actually don't want to misspeak on that because I'm not, to be honest with you, totally sure if there's certain laws or regulations in place. My understanding, and some of the folks I've talked to, they are just doing somebody they've trained. They, they have a, a quality thermometer that they went out and purchased. 
they've had this person trained up on how to use it. And when someone walks through, it's just could be a plant supervisor, manager, whoever, they are doing the screening. Now, whether that's any sort of violation of certain laws, I probably need to get a little more educated on that, but that's a great question. Yeah, and I would say, Ben, really that's up to the company because I could see a situation where, you know, let's say you have a company with 30 employees and they decide they want to they want to do this. Uh, you know, at that point in time, uh, what I'm seeing is they're leaving that up to HR, right? So if somebody if somebody screens uh, that they could potentially uh, or that they have an elevated body temperature then that's where they get HR involved. And they're not using a, quote, medical professional. Kurt, here's a great point slash question from Harvey. He says, if a worker arrives asymptomatic, uh, they may pass the test. During the workday, they may start developing some sort of symptoms. The mobotics being a continue, continual detection is a better option than simply just using a thermometer to test upon entry at the beginning of the day. I think that's a great point. Sure, you may feel great, be normal as you show up to work, but as the day goes on, things may change. You know, you may start having an elevated surface temperature. You may want to have folks potentially have a protocol set up where maybe at lunch you go out for lunch break and you get re-scanned by the camera, re-entry, and maybe do that again at the end of the day. But I think that's a good point. You can really do this as often or as much as you need to and you really reduce the workload on the individual standing there at a building. I think a good example, I talked to someone at a processing plant, food processing plant, and they have hundreds of workers coming in for three different shifts a day. And there, it's a major backlog. When everyone shows up to work for the first shift, they've got two nurses out there scanning two people at a time as they come into the work. And it's very taxing, it's expensive, it's taking forever, long lines for workers just to get into work. You gotta do the same thing for the second shift, same thing for the third shift. So you can maybe put two or three Mobotics cameras at different entry points in your building, really automate that process, and you go down to just a single nurse or a single scanner as your backup for when somebody alerts or flags the temperature threshold, then bring them out and give that person a second look, but not standing there in harm's way all day long doing the screening themselves. So Harvey, thank you for that. That's a good point. Yeah, Ben, here's one. Has there been any instances where someone has been turned back from entering a facility and then that has evolved into some type of litigation? Uh, the, the quick and simple answer is no, I'm not aware of any. Now, I mean, it's not saying that that can't happen, but Ben, have you heard of anything in that regard? I have not. No one that I'm aware of has, has told me anything about that, but it's, it's a good point to think about, but I, I'm not aware of that. Here's a good question from David. Uh, how large of a group can we effectively monitor and detect? And let me go back really quick, if you'll bear with me, to that slide I showed earlier. I think this maybe gives us a little bit of a good visual. So here's a sample scenario where we set up, you know, in a hallway, you see three zones. So theoretically, in this, this environment, we'd be able to scan about three people at the same time coming through, you know, uh, bear, pretend for a minute that hallway wall you see on the right is not there, a little wider hallway. We could have three people coming through. Now, we also ideally want to have, you know, the thermal camera is about nine frames a second. So we need to have about a second uh, of the front of their face. As I mentioned earlier, kind of forehead, corner of the eye, clear shot of the face, about a second. So it doesn't mean you have to just stand there and look up at the camera and, you know, you know count one Mississippi two. It's not like that. But you also don't want to just be breezing by it, looking sideways, looking down, and get a glancing shot of their face. So... It, it ideally is suited to some sort of checkpoint or hallway, uh, choke point, I should say, hallway where someone's coming to the camera head on, mounted, you know, about eye level and within 15 feet. And then that also depends on how wide is that choke point, what angle of lens. You're going to get a much wider field of view with a 45 degree lens than you will with a 25 degree lens. However, the 25 degree lens can give you maybe a little better accuracy, you know, beyond that 12 to 15 foot range. So it's, it's a really hard thing to say. We can scan 10 people at once. It's going to depend on how far they are from the camera, how wide your area is, of your viewing area, and then how close we're mounting the camera to those folks and dial it in. But I would say, roughly speaking, I'm seeing typically three to four people scanned at a single time entering a building. That's pretty commonly what, what we're doing in a lot of the projects I'm involved with. Yeah, and Ben, I... Uh... It was pointed out to me by Simone that I misspoke, which can happen from time to time. 
uh, I said our next uh, webinar was next Thursday. Um, I, I was incorrect on that. It is actually uh, next Tuesday. Uh, so it, it, what day is it anyway, right? I mean, I, I don't know if y'all are in the same boat I am. It's uh, kind of tough to keep up uh, with all of this. So uh, one, one, if you don't mind, let me interrupt on that. Just to, to tee that up, that's going to be hosted by our colleague, Mark Heinzman. He's actually a lot more technical than Kurt or I are. So for our purposes today, we basically read you a bunch of slides off of slide tech. Mark's actually going to be digging into this a little bit even beyond that, you know, actually showing you the solution line, showing you a mobile cart solution he's mocked up at his home. You know, if you want to get into the nitty or gritty details technically, I think that webinar is going to be great for that purpose because, you know, full disclosure, uh, these cameras, they, they require some calibration, but it's nothing to be super intimidated by because if guys like Kurt and I can learn how to program these things and offset for temperature variances, uh, you can do it as well. So I think Mark's presentation is geared more to the nuts and bolts actually, okay, you bought into the solution, you like it, let's get this thing set up and configured. So that's going to be our, our next webinar for next week. Well, Ben, I got to tell you, you hurt my feelings. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, we are we are past an hour. I apologize. Uh, I, I think we got to most all the questions. The ones uh, that we didn't answer, we will certainly get you an answer. But to wrap up, again, next Tuesday will be that deep dive. Uh, I want you to know we're here to help. Uh, so please get your BDMs involved. Um, no matter if you're in, in, you know, Canada, the U.S., Latin America, get us involved. We'd love to help you, uh, you know, get to the to the end users and, and get uh, get business done. So we're here to help you. Please use us. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, and we look forward to uh, to working with you closely and getting some. Uh, thermal radiometry sold and, and getting all of our countries back to work. So thank you very much. We will talk to you soon. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you.